Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Molly's Kitchen. My name is Aaron. Today we're going to go over one of my favorite recipes it's for German potato salad. Now, I know most of you don't know what German potato salad is. Some people haven't tried it, some people have. But I've never made this recipe for anyone and they didn't like it. So that's why we're putting it on our YouTube channel for Molly's Kitchen. We're going to start off with cutting our potatoes. Now, I've already taken the liberty of cutting most of them, but I'm going to show a demo one so you guys have an idea. You want to cut the pieces so they're about maybe that big. Now I know that the camera can't really see how big that is, but if you start off with a potato that's about the size of a ping pong ball or a little bit smaller than a golf ball, it's pretty easy. You're just going to take your potato, you're going to cut it in half horizontally, and then next we're going to cut those parts in half again. And then after that, we're going to cut those parts another time go in the opposite direction. So you're going to end up with eight pieces for one potato, about like that. We're going to go ahead and take these and putting them in blanching water. In case you didn't know, blanching water is just water with salt in it. You want it to be salty like the ocean is salty. I don't know how many people out there have tried seawater. It's pretty salty though. It's about two gallons of water to maybe a half a cup of salt. Hold on just a second. Now that we have that going, we can move on to more important things. The next thing that makes German potato salad unique is it actually has celery in it. Now I know you guys are looking at this piece of celery and you probably think, why does he leave all the leaves on it? My wife was horrified the first time that she saw me throw celery leaves away because as I learned later, when I needed celery leaves and had to go buy them, they're very, very expensive. And why not use part of the plant that is actually stronger in flavor than the whole piece of celery to begin with? So the best thing to do is to leave it with the leaves. You can go ahead and cut the end of the stalks like that right there because those can be dirty sometimes from where they were growing. You want to trim the stalk on this end to take it off and make sure guys that you always rinse your celery because there's always mud and dirt and little crevices. We're going to go ahead and give this a try and chop this up real quick here. Now with the bigger pieces of celery, you're going to want to cut them a little bit smaller. So I'm just showing you what a uh, uh, small piece of celery, just to give you an idea of how much to cut it. If you have a regular piece of celery like this one right here, most of your stock will have pieces like this. What you're going to do is you're going to cut it in half by length, and then you're going to cut that into smaller pieces. You want these pieces to be not quite a medium dice, but almost. The medium dice is half inch by half inch by half inch. You reach that by taking a batonet knife cut and you cut it um, vertically and you end up with pieces that are, you know, the size of a cube, about half inch by half inch by half inch. We're almost done with the celery. And the next thing I'm going to show you is my classic trick with cutting an onion. There is an easy way to cut an onion without having coarse chop or anything like that going on. I'm going to show that to you next. As far as potato salad is concerned, I learned this from, it's actually a family's recipe. I got the recipe which I tweaked a little bit to make it my own, but this recipe came from my grandmother. She's, she lived in Germany back in the 50s, and that's where she got the recipe from. My mom was actually born in Germany, but she's lived here in America her whole life. Parents were in Germany. My grandfather was in the Air Force, and that's how they ended up being there. Now that we've got the celery chopped up, we're going to go ahead and transfer this into a ramekin. Leaves and all. And we're going to set this to the side. Next thing I'm going to show you is how to quickly and easily chop an onion. Take your onion, make sure that you leave the end piece on, on the end that's the root. The top piece, you can go ahead and chop that off, but save the root end. And what you do pretty much is you just chop off the top of it and you make a cut going like that um, vertically. And you go ahead and peel away the dry skin. You don't want that dry skin. So we have our half an onion here. We're just going to make vertical cuts and we're going to space them about a quarter inch apart. This recipe, I like to add a little bit, of, a little bit more onion to it than most people would. You can go ahead and tweak this recipe to however you like it. The biggest difference between a German potato salad and a regular potato salad 
is that a German potato salad is made with a little bit of vinegar. It's got celery, which most potato salads don't have. We use the red onion because it looks better than the yellow. It's just for looks. Now that we've made our vertical cuts, we're going to go ahead and cut it horizontally once and twice. Depending on the size of the onion, you may need to make that cut several times. And then we're going to chop it again vertically going the opposite direction of the first cuts that you made. And the piece that you end up with from the end is only that big. You can go ahead and take that and just toss that. Get this all back over here. What you end up with is beautiful, fine, medium diced cut pieces of onion. About a quarter inch by a quarter inch by a quarter inch. Doing the same thing with this one. We already cut it vertically. Now we're cutting it horizontally. And again, you're just going to cut against the first cuts that you made. So you end up, like I said, with a perfectly diced onion. That's the trick, guys. That's it. Simple as that. Now we have our onions and our celery. It's all done. We're going to take a short break. And the next thing that we're going to go over is how to cut your bait. Guys, back again from that short little break. We're just going to go over how to cut your bacon. When I buy bacon for this particular recipe, I always go to the meat department to buy it. It's usually thicker sliced. You can buy it either regular plain bacon or pepper bacon. Usually I prefer to get pepper bacon, but this time we just stuck with regular plain old everyday bacon. And like I said, when you get it from the meat department, it tends to be sliced a lot thicker. One other important thing I'd like to go over real quick is the fact that as you can see, my cutting board has changed. I'm no longer using a wooden cutting board. The reason for that is because the wood is practically impossible to clean. Once it's contaminated, I mean, you've got to scrub it and scrub it and scrub it and don't want to cut meat on a wooden cutting board just to keep down the contamination. But like I said, we're back just a moment just to show you how to cut the bacon. This bacon is about a quarter inch thick slice and we're going to cut them, the pieces to be about a quarter inch thick and a half an inch wide. I like a lot of bacon. My wife is not such a big fan of it, but I like a lot of bacon. So I use a lot of bacon when I make this recipe. And typically, she never complains about the amount of bacon in the recipe. Right about now, our potatoes should be boiled enough to be what you call fork tender. When I mean fork tender, I mean when you poke it with a fork, the, the potatoes should pretty much just fall apart. You don't want to overcook your potatoes and you don't want to undercook them. Overcook them and you'll end up with mashed German potato salad. Undercook them and they'll be inedible. Okay guys, we're back for the funnest part. It's time to render our bacon. When I say render, I'm talking about cooking the bacon until all the fat comes out of it. And we want to save that fat because we can use that for um, to cook the onions and the celery. Now, when I spoke to you guys earlier about the potatoes, I forgot to mention that you don't want to use a regular Yukon Gold potato. For this, I actually bought what's called a potato medley. It's yellow potatoes with red rose potatoes with blue potatoes. They're actually cooked right now, so I'm going to show you real quick what I mean when I say fork tender. Fork tender means that it's going to easily be cut with a fork, just like that. Now, the potato medley that I was talking to you about, we have blue potatoes, and we have yellow potatoes, and somewhere in there is some red rose potatoes. If you don't know what a red rose potato is, it's just a red potato. There's nothing fancy about it. These potatoes that I got were really small. So if you're using a red rose full-size potato, you're going to end up cutting it more and more and more. Like I said, you want pieces that are roughly three-quarters of an inch by three-quarters of an inch cubed. So you go ahead and give this a stir. looking pretty good so far. My house is filling with a delicious smell of bacon, which I happen to love. And we're just going to cook this until we've, until we've rendered it. The bacon is going to stay in the pan this whole time. We're just going to start adding other stuff to it as soon as there's enough grease there to render it. Just a quick tip. Make sure that when you're cooking on a stove, do not have your handle out like that. You never know, someone could just come walking by and run into it. And then the stuff that's in the pan, which is hot, 
and spill all over your little kid or your dogs or your pets or whatever you may have running around the house. Always trying to watch out for kitchen safety. A little trick, if you want to learn how to flip food like that, it's really easy. You just take your food and you move it down to the bottom part of the pan and it's a flip of the wrist. I started learning that method using potatoes, believe it or not, because they're cheap and it's okay if they fall on the floor or whatever, you just throw them away. It's no big deal. Or you could try rice or pretty much anything can flip like that. We're just waiting for that bacon to, to get a little more rendered. It's, it's almost there. You don't want to overcook your bacon because you still want to be, you don't necessarily want this bacon to be crispy. Now, like I said, German potato salad is a little different than regular everyday potato salad because you use vinegar. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and go over my ingredients and how to make this. We've got our good friend kosher salt. And I already have two teaspoons measured out for me. We might need a little bit more. I'm not sure. It just depends on how salty your bacon is. And this is one of those recipes that every time I make it, it changes just a little bit. It just depends. Here I have five tablespoons of flour. We're probably only going to need three, maybe four. You just need it to thicken the, the roux. The roux is when you take flour and you cook it in a pan with fat. And what we're going to do is we're going to next add the celery and onions to this. And once the onions are translucent, then we're going to go ahead and add the flour and start making our roux. Sugar is another important part of German potato salad. Here I have four tablespoons of sugar. I've got a half a cup of apple cider vinegar. You want to use apple cider, not white, because you want that tart vinegar flavor in your potato salad. And like I said, this is a little bit different every single time I make it. So I like to have extra stuff on hand, like extra vinegar, extra sugar, bacon. So I have my grinder right here. I have about a teaspoon of salt, or no, not of salt, of pepper, I mean freshly ground black pepper. And um, that's pretty much it. Now that this bacon is rendered down to the point, we can actually add the uh, celery. because The celery is going to take slightly longer to cook than the onions. As you saw in the video, I had three stalks of celery that I used to make this recipe. And we're going to saute that just until it softens up just a little bit. Another important tip is I actually I really like stainless steel. I don't like to use Teflon pans for anything unless I have to. And the one thing you got to watch out for when you're cooking is if you're using a Teflon pan, do not use metal utensils in your Teflon pan. I know we see it all the time in cooking shows and even shows like MasterChef Junior. You see the kids stirring stuff in a Teflon pot. And the biggest thing that's wrong with that is that Teflon it's a carcinogen, so when you're scraping it with a metal whisk or whatever you happen to be using, you can end up with flakes of Teflon in your food, and that Teflon is poisonous. It's toxic and it's carcinogenic. Stainless steel pans can be treated so they can be non-stick. Unfortunately, they tend to be a lot higher in price. It's pretty expensive to get a nice stainless steel pan, but it's worth the money. And you can always season your pan so that it is a non-stick pan. You just do that by turning the heat up on your pan, you add some oil, and you get it to where it's almost smoking. And, then, and the last important tip about stainless steel I'm going to tell you guys about is that don't put it in the dishwasher. You'll end up with water spots and hard water, and it's, it's no good. Like I said, I love stainless steel cookware. It's what I learned what to cook on originally when I started cooking, when I could reach the counter. I always like to help my mom in the kitchen. I, I found it uh, fun. Next thing we're going to add now that the celery is cooked just a little bit is the onion. Remember we cut that onion. We did a, a medium dice on that onion, which is quarter inch by quarter inch by quarter inch. And like I said, we, we still want the vegetables to be a little crunchy, like the celery. We want to look out for that crunch. I'm glad at this point that I picked a large size pan to do this in because I was actually thinking of doing it in a smaller pan and that would have been terrible because it wouldn't have been big enough. The next thing we're going to add is the flour to make the root. And you've got to make sure when you're doing this, you stir it frequently. You don't want that flour to stick to the bottom. It's going to be bad. And we want to cook this 
about until the, the flour taste is gone. You don't want to be tasting flour in your um, in your roux. It does go away after a while. It just takes a little bit of cooking. The more you cook your roux, the darker it'll become. And the darker it becomes, the less chance it has to actually thicken. And like I said, roux is super easy to make. It's just flour with water, or flour with grease, I'm sorry. And like I said, you can make it in varying colors and, and potential. Like I said, the darker you have it, the less sticking power it's actually gonna have. Now, like I said, you gotta make sure that you stir this constantly and make sure that you're scraping the bottom of your pan so that flour doesn't stick to it. It's gonna wanna try to stick to it, and you don't want that. The next thing we're gonna add to this, guys, is our apple cider vinegar and a little bit of water. I know you guys didn't see it, but my sous chef over here is always helping out. She grabbed me some water this time. I forgot to grab that when I was making this. Then need just a little bit more, please. Gotta love a sous chef. You have to have a helper in the kitchen, otherwise it's not a family activity. Molly's Kitchen is actually an acronym that stands for Matthew, Aaron, Lori, and Isaiah, and those are the members of my family. Sabian is the S part of Molly's Kitchen, and he isn't born yet. He's still got another couple months to, to, to cook in there before he's ready to come out. I made sure that when I started doing this, I grabbed enough utensils because we're going to want to taste everything until we got it nice and balanced. If you want it to be a little more tart, you can simply add a little more vinegar. If you want it to be sweeter, you simply add more sugar. It's as easy as that. It's whatever you want to taste. We're going to go ahead and throw the salt in there. Like I said, we started off with two teaspoons. We're only going to use one so far because I don't know how salty this bacon is and you never really know. And like I said, you want to taste it and taste it and taste it until you actually have a product that's palatable to you or your family. Some people can't stand vinegar. I love the apple cider vinegar part of this. It's nice and tart. I'm going to go ahead and toss the pepper in. Like I said, we had a teaspoon and we're going to use that whole teaspoon. And it may even need more. Like I said, when I make this, I usually make it with peppered bacon and I didn't use pepper bacon this time. So we want to make sure that we have enough salt and pepper and sugar and vinegar. And it's, it's all going to come together. Normally when I make this, I double the recipe for the sauce because I like to have a lot of sauce. Now that that's in there, we're going to go ahead and add a little bit of the sugar. Like I said, I think I started off with four tablespoons. We're going to start this recipe off with two tablespoons. Give it a stir, and as you can see, the, the stuff is getting thicker and thicker and thicker the longer it cooks. So we need to continue to add water to that so that it doesn't get too thick. All together, guys, we've used about a cup and a quarter of water so far. And we're still going to need maybe even a little bit more. Could you grab some more water for me, please? As soon as our baby's born, I'll make sure that I put my wife on here to help me cook because it's always good to have an extra helping hand in the kitchen. But as for right now, she really doesn't want to be on the camera. I don't blame her. I'd rather not be on the camera too if I was pregnant, but I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> our sauce is looking really good, guys. Um, we're going to go ahead and give it a taste. It's pretty good, but it does need some more salt. It does need a little bit more pepper and it does need a little bit more vinegar. When you're tasting it, that's the sugar, I don't want that. When we're tasting it, we're looking out on our tongue for the different things that we're looking for, the saltiness, the pepper content, the sugar and the vinegar. I tend to make my German potato salad with more vinegar than most people use, but it's pretty much however you like it. Now. The thing about German potato salad is really cool. You can serve it either hot or cold. It's good both ways. Our sauce is looking pretty good. We're going to go ahead and 
ahead and take a quick break right now. We're going to take care of our potatoes and I'm going to set everything up back on that counter and uh, we're going to roll with that. Okay guys, we're back for the last and final step. All we got to do is put it together now. So I grab myself a, a medium sized bowl. We're going to take our fork tender potato medley and dump it in there. The next step is going to be to add the bacon, and celery, and onion sauce. This is poured in there like this. And the last thing that you really need to watch out for when you're making German potato salad is to make sure that you don't over mix it because like I said we use a medley of potatoes and the last thing we want is to actually have a blue potato salad or purple. I'm colorblind so it looks blue to me but it might actually be purple. <laughs> we just want it to be mixed good enough so that all the sauce is incorporated in with the uh, potatoes. Hey guys, it's as simple as that, our finished product. Just like that, we're going to take one taste. It's delicious. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to Molly's Kitchen. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.